Okay, tonight is the 7th of August, uh, 2011, and this is the 22nd night we are talking on the uh, Diga Nikaya Suttas. Uh. And tonight we come to Sutta number 29, Pasadika Sutta, the delightful discourse. Thus have I heard, once the Lord was staying among the Sakyans at the building in the mango grove belonging to the Vedanya family. At that time, the Niganta Nataputta had just died at Pava, and at his death, the Nigantas were split into two parties, quarreling and disputing, fighting and attacking each other with wordy warfare. You don't understand this doctrine and discipline, or Dhamma Vinaya. I do. How could you understand this Dhamma Vinaya? Your way is all wrong. Mine is right. I am consistent. You aren't. You said last what you should have said first, and you said first what you should have said last. What you took so long to think up has been refuted. Your argument has been overthrown. You are defeated. Go on. Save your doctrine. Get out of that if you can. You would have thought the Nigantas, Nataputta's disciples, were bent on killing each other. Even the white-robed lay followers were disgusted, displeased and repelled when they saw that their Dhamma Vinaya was so ill-proclaimed, so unedifyingly displayed, and so ineffectual in calming the passions, having been proclaimed by one not fully enlightened, and now with its support gone, without an arbiter. Now the novice Chunda, who had spent the reins at Pava, came to Samagama to see the Venerable Ananda. Saluting him, he sat down to one side and said, Sir, the Niganta Nataputta has just died at Pava. And he related what had happened. The Venerable Ananda said, Chunda, that is something that ought to be reported to the Blessed Lord. Let us go and tell him. Very good, sir, said Chunda. So they went to the Lord and told him. He said, Chunda, here is a Dhamma Vinaya that is ill-proclaimed, unedifyingly displayed, and ineffectual in calming the passions, because its proclaimer was not fully enlightened. Such being the case, Chunda, a disciple cannot live according to that, dumb, to that doctrine and maintain proper conduct, nor live by it, but deviates from it. To him one might say, Friend, this is what you have received, and you have your opportunity. Your teacher is not fully enlightened. You cannot live according to that doctrine, but deviate from it. In this case, Chunda, the teacher is to be blamed. The doctrine is to be blamed, but the pupil is praiseworthy. And if anyone were to say to that pupil, Come now, Reverend Sir, practice according to the doctrine proclaimed and given out by your teacher. Then the one who urged this, the thing urged and the one who so practiced, would all gain much demerit. Why? Because the doctrine is ill-proclaimed. But here Chunda is a teacher who is not fully enlightened. And a disciple lives according to that doctrine and conforms to it. One might say to him, Friend, what you have received is no good. Your opportunity is a poor one. Your teacher is not fully enlightened. His teaching is ill-proclaimed, but yet you continue to live according to it. In this case, the teacher, the doctrine, and the disciple are all to blame. And if anyone were to say, Well, Reverend Sir, by following that system you will be successful. The one who so recommended it, that which was recommended, and the one who, on hearing such recommendation, should make still greater efforts, would all gain much demerit. Why? Because the doctrine is ill-proclaimed. I stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha is talking about a teacher uh, who is not enlightened. Uh, and uh, uh, some people follow him. Uh, and they are blamable. Uh, uh, unless uh, they don't uh, follow that teaching. Uh, uh. So this brings to mind uh, nowadays, uh, even within Buddhism, uh, you have so many later books uh, uh, written by people who are not fully enlightened. So it's a mistake uh, to follow those books. Uh. Buddha says, uh, then you are blamable. Uh. 
But here now is a teacher who is fully enlightened. His doctrine is well proclaimed, edifyingly displayed, effectual in calming the passions because of that enlightened teacher. But the disciple does not live up to the doctrine, but deviates from it. In that case, one might say to him, Friend, you have failed. You have missed your opportunity. Your teacher is fully enlightened. His doctrine is well proclaimed. But you do not follow it. You deviate from it. In this case, the teacher and the doctrine are praiseworthy. But the pupil is to blame. And if anyone were to say, Well, Reverend Sir, you should follow the teaching proclaimed by your teacher. Then the one who urged this, that which was urged, and the one who so practiced would all gain much merit. Why? Because the doctrine is well proclaimed. But now, Chunda, here is a teacher who is fully enlightened. His doctrine is well proclaimed, and the disciple, having taken it up, follows it, practicing it properly and keeping to it. Someone might say to him, Friend, what you have received is good. Here is your opportunity, and you are following the doctrine of your teacher. In this case, the teacher and the doctrine are praiseworthy, and the pupil is also praiseworthy. And if anyone were to say to such a disciple, Well, Reverend Sir, by following that system, you will be successful. Then the one who thus recommended it, and that which was commended, commended, and the one who, on hearing such commendation, should make still greater efforts, would all gain much merit. Why? Because that is so when the doctrine when the Dhamma and Vinaya, doctrine and discipline, are well proclaimed, edifyingly displayed and effectual in calming the passions because of the fully enlightened teacher and supreme Buddha. Stop here for a moment. So here, the teacher is fully enlightened, a Buddha. And if the uh, disciple follows his teacher's words, then he is praiseworthy. Uh, but if he deviates from it, uh, then he's blamable. Uh. But now, Chunda, suppose a teacher has arisen in a world, an Arahan, Samasam Buddha, and his doctrine is well proclaimed, effectual in calming the passions because of that teacher. But his disciples have not fully mastered that true Dhamma. The full purity of the holy life has not become clear and evident to them in the logic of its unfolding and has not been sufficiently grounded among them being still in course of being well proclaimed among humans at the time of the teacher's passing from among them. That way, Chunda, the teacher's death would be a sad thing for his disciples. Why? They would think, our teacher rose in the world for us, an Arahan, Samasam Buddha, whose doctrine was well proclaimed. But we did not fully master the true Dhamma, as long as it was well proclaimed among humans. And now our teacher has passed away from among us. That way the teacher's death would be a sad thing for his disciples. Uh, stop here for a moment. Huh? You notice here that the uh, Dhamma taught by the Arahan Samasam Buddha, if the disciple did not master the true Dhamma, uh, mastering the true Dhamma means uh, being extremely familiar uh, with his words lah, in the suttas. Lah. Uh, then... Uh, Otherwise, if they, they don't, uh, they are not extremely familiar uh, with the suttas, uh, then they have not mastered the Dhamma. Uh. But suppose a teacher has arisen in the world and his disciples have fully mastered the true Dhamma. The full purity of the holy life has become clear and evident to them in the logic of its unfolding and has been sufficiently grounded among them while being thus well proclaimed among humans by the time of the teacher's passing from them. That way, the teacher's death would not be a sad thing for his disciples. Why? They would think, our teacher arose in the world for us, and we have fully mastered the true Dhamma, while it was thus proclaimed among humans, and now our teacher has passed away from among us. That way, the teacher's death would not be a sad thing for his disciples. But Chunda, if the holy life is so circumstanced and there is no teacher who is senior of long standing, long ordained, mature and advanced in seniority, then in such a case the holy life will be imperfect. But if such a teacher exists, then the holy life can be perfected in such a case. If in, in such a case there is such a senior teacher 
But if there are no senior disciples among the monks who are experienced, trained, skilled, who have attained peace from bondage, who are able to proclaim the true Dhamma, able to refute any opposing doctrines that may arise by means of the true Dhamma, and having done so, give a rounded exposition of Dhamma, then the holy life is not perfected. In such cases, if there are such senior teachers and such senior disciples, but there are no monks of middle standing with these qualities, or, despite the presence of these, no junior monks with these qualities, or no senior disciples among the nuns, or no middle-ranking or junior nuns, or no white-robed lay followers, male or female, celibate or otherwise, or if the teaching does not prosper and flourish, is not widespread, widely known, proclaimed far and wide, or even if these conditions are fulfilled, has not gained the first place in public support, then the holy life is not perfected. If, however, all these conditions are fulfilled, then the holy life is perfected. But Chunda, I have now arisen in the world as an Arhan Samasam Buddha. The Dhamma is well proclaimed. My disciples are proficient in the true Dhamma. The full purity of the holy life has become clear and evident to them in the logic of its unfolding. But now I am an aged teacher of long standing who went forth a long time ago, and my life is coming to its close. However, there are senior teachers among the monks who are experienced, trained, skilled, who have attained peace from bondage, able to proclaim the true Dhamma, able to refute by means of the Dhamma any opposing doctrines that may arise, and having done so, give a grounded exposition of Dhamma. And there are middle-ranking monks who are disciplined and experienced. There are novices who are disciples. There are senior middle-ranking and novice monks, nuns, and novice nuns who are disciples. There are white-robed lay followers, male and female, celibate and non-celibate. And the holy life I proclaim prospers and flourishes, is widespread, widely known, proclaimed far and wide, well proclaimed among humans. Among all the teachers now existing in the world, Chunda, I see none who has attained to such a position of fame and following as I have. Of all, <coughs> of all the orders and groups in the world, I see none as famous and well followed as my Sangha of monks. If anyone were to refer to any holy way of life as being fully successful and perfect, with nothing lacking and nothing superfluous, well proclaimed in the perfection of its purity, it is this holy life they would be describing. It was Udaka Ramaputta who used to say, he sees but does not see. I stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha is saying that his uh, sasana, the uh, religion, is uh, uh, perfect because the teacher is enlightened, the disciples fully understand his teaching, and he has senior disciples uh, who can teach what he has taught, uh, and there are middle uh, ranking disciples and junior disciples and lay followers, uh, all who uh, know his teaching well, uh, and his teaching is widespread, widely known, uh, um, and all that. Uh, that's why he says uh, it is uh, perfect. Uh. It was Udaka Ramaputta who used to say, he sees but does not see. What is it that seeing one does not see? You can see the blade of a well-sharpened razor, but not its edge. That is what he meant by saying, he sees but does not see. He spoke in reference to a low, vulgar, worldly, ignoble thing of no spiritual significance, a mere razor. But if one were to use the, that expression properly, he sees but does not see, it would be like this. What he sees is a holy way of life which is fully successful and perfect, with nothing lacking and nothing superfluous, 
well proclaimed in the perfection of its purity. If he were to deduct anything from it, thinking in this way it will be purer, he does not see it. And if he were to add anything to it, thinking in this way it will be more complete, then he does not see it. That is the meaning of the saying, he sees but does not see. Therefore, Chunda, if anyone were to refer to any holy way of life as being fully successful and perfect, it is this holy life they would be describing. I stop here for a moment. Uh. This is an extremely important uh, paragraph uh, the Buddha is saying here. Uh. Uh, the Buddha first, uh, he says, uh, his uh, holy way of life uh, is perfect. Uh. Uh, secondly, uh, there is nothing lacking, uh, nothing superfluous. Uh. Uh, in other words, uh, it is complete. Uh. Complete. Uh. Guan Juan, Guan Mua. Uh. Perfect is Guan Mua, isn't it? In Hokkien. Uh, complete is Guan Chuan. And then, uh, uh, utterly pure, uh, perfection of its purity. So there are three characteristics of the Buddha's uh, teaching. Uh. Uh, one is it is perfect. The other one it is complete. The third one it is utterly pure. Uh. So the Buddha says, uh, if anybody thinks uh, he wants to deduct anything from the Buddha's words, uh, he does not understand, uh, he does not see it, that means not see the Dhamma, does not understand the Dhamma. Uh, and if he wants to add anything to the Buddha's words, uh, thinking it will be more complete, uh, then also he does not see the Dhamma, uh, he does not understand the Dhamma. Uh, uh, which means uh, that those later monks uh, who added to the Buddha's words, uh, uh, wrote the later suttas and they wrote the uh, later books uh, like the commentaries and the Abhidhamma and all that, uh, the Sudhimaga and all that. Uh, according to the Buddha, they don't understand the Dhamma uh, because if they understand the Dhamma, then they will know uh, that the Buddha's words are perfect and complete and utterly pure. Uh, you don't need to add to his words. Uh, what he has said uh, is already enough. Why must you add to his words? Uh, even things like about meditation, uh, what the Buddha has explained uh, is complete, uh, perfect. Uh, uh, you don't need to add to his words about meditation or so. Uh, because the, per the certain things uh, like the Buddha didn't say, uh, it's purposely because he didn't say it. Uh, not that it, he, he doesn't know how to say it. Uh, purposely doesn't say certain things because, why? Because meditation is something uh, each person is different. Uh, you've got to practice it yourself uh, and find a way. Uh, that is suitable for you. Lah. The basic teaching, uh, for example, about uh, noticing the breath coming in and out, uh, uh, that is the basic principle. Uh, where you want to notice the breath, how you want to notice the breath, uh, each person is different. Uh, that's why a lot of things uh, the Buddha did not say uh, because it's not necessary. Uh, on the other hand, you find some teachers, uh, they say so much about meditation, uh, uh, so that uh, you say, you find uh, those disciples following the teacher uh, who have taught, said so many things, uh, they have a sipan, a sipan view uh, of that meditation. Uh, their, their meditation must go exactly according to that way. Uh, that otherwise, it's not correct. Uh, so they want it so badly uh, that uh, they start to see those things that they want to see. Uh. Uh. Just like some people want to see the light, uh, then they see the light. Uh, because it's very easy uh, to imagine uh, what you like to imagine. To continue, uh, the Buddha said, Therefore, Chunda, all you to whom I have taught these truths that I have realized by super knowledge should come together and recite them, setting meaning beside meaning and expression beside expression, without dissension, in order that this holy life may continue and be established for a long time for the profit and happiness of the many out of compassion for the world and for the benefit, profit and happiness of devas and humans. And what are the things that you should recite together? They are the four intense states of mindfulness, the four right efforts, the four bases of psychic power, the five spiritual faculties, the five mental powers, the seven factors of enlightenment, the noble eightfold path. These are the things you should recite together. And thus you must train yourselves. 
being assembled in harmony and without dissension. If a fellow in the holy life quotes Dhamma in the assembly, and if you think he has either misunderstood the sense or expressed it wrongly, you should neither applaud nor reject it, but should say to him, Friend, if you mean such and such, you should put it either like this or like that. Which is the more appropriate? Or if you say such and such, you mean either this or that. Which is the more appropriate? If he replies, this meaning is better expressed like this than like that, or the sense of this expression is this rather than that, then his words should be neither rejected nor disparaged. But you should explain to him carefully the correct meaning and expression. Again, Chunda, if a fellow in the holy life quotes Dhamma in the assembly, and if you think he has misunderstood the sense, though he has expressed it correctly, you should neither applaud nor reject it, but should say to him, Friend, these words can either mean this or that. Which sense is the more appropriate? And if he replies, they mean this, then his words should be neither rejected nor disparaged. But you should explain to him carefully the correct meaning. And similarly, if you think he has got the right meaning but expressed it wrongly, you should explain to him carefully the correct meaning and expression. But Chunda, if you think he has got the right meaning and expressed it correctly, you should say good and should applaud and congratulate him, saying, We are lucky, we are most fortunate to find a new friend, a companion in the holy life, who is so well versed in both the meaning and the expression. I'll stop here for a moment. Uh, so here, the Buddha... Firstly, uh, at the top, uh, the Buddha says uh, there are certain teachings uh, which are very important, uh, which the monks should constantly focus on, uh, uh, recite it. Uh. What are these? These are the, the 37 bodhipakya, uh, the four uh, intense states of mindfulness, satipatthana, the four right efforts by Yama, the four bases of psychic power, uh, idipada, the five faculties, uh, Indriya, the five powers, uh, Bala, the seven factors of enlightenment, Bojanga, the noble eightfold path, Arya Atangika Maga. If you add four plus four plus four plus five plus five plus seven plus eight, you get thirty-seven. So these are called the thirty-seven Bodhipakya Dhammas. When you practice these thirty-seven Bodhipakya Dhammas and perfect them, uh, then you have perfected the Noble Eightfold Path also. Uh, so, uh, after that, the Buddha says uh, that if some uh, monk uh, uh, teaches the Dhamma and the meaning is not so clear, uh, then it should be discussed uh, and made clearer. Uh, Chunda, I do not teach a Dhamma for restraining the asavas that arise in the present life alone. I do not teach a Dhamma merely for their destruction in future lives, but one for their restraining in this life as well as for their destruction in future lives. Accordingly, Chunda, let the robe I have allowed you be simply for warding off the cold, for warding off the heat, for warding off the touch of gadfly, mosquito, wind, sun, and creeping things, just so as to protect your modesty. Let the arms food I have allowed you be just enough for the support and sustenance of the body, for keeping it unimpaired, for the furtherance of the holy life, with the thought, thus I shall eliminate the former feeling without giving rise to a new one. In that way I shall live without fault and in comfort. Let the lodging I have allowed you be simply for warding off the cold, for warding off the heat, for warding off the touch of gadfly, mosquito, wind, sun, and creeping things, just for allaying the perils of the seasons and for the enjoyment of seclusion. Let the provision of medicines and necessities for the treatment of sickness that I have allowed you be just for warding off feelings of sickness that have arisen and for the maintenance of health. Stop here for a moment. Uh. So here the Buddha says, uh, his teaching, uh, his teaching uh, is for the uh, restraining uh, or destruction of the asavas, uh, the uncontrolled mental outflows, uh, not only this life but future lives as well. Uh. 
And then the rope uh, is only for protecting us from the cold and heat and the uh, insects and the uh, creeping things. Uh, uh, and then the food uh, is for the support and sustenance of the body so that we can practice the holy life, uh, continue to practice the holy life. Uh. Thus I shall eliminate the former feeling. The former feeling should refer to the feeling of hunger. Uh, when we eat the food, uh, we eliminate the hunger uh, without giving rise to a new one. Without giving rise to greed, uh, greed for good food. Uh, then that way I shall live without fault, uh, blameless uh, and uh, in comfort. Uh. So the lodging also uh, is for protecting us from the cold, the heat, uh, insects and the sun and wind and for seclusion and then the medicines and all that uh, for warding of sickness. Uh. It may be, Chunda, that wanderers of other sects might say the ascetics who follow the Sakyan are addicted to a life of devotion to pleasure. If so, they should be asked, what kind of a life of devotion to pleasure, friend? For such a life can take many forms. There are, Chunda, four kinds of life devoted to pleasure which are low, vulgar, worldly, ignoble, and not conducive to welfare, not leading to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to tranquility, to realization, to enlightenment, to nibbana. What are they? Firstly, a foolish person takes pleasure and delight in killing living beings. Secondly, someone takes pleasure and delight in taking what is not given. Thirdly, someone takes pleasure and delight in telling lies. Fourthly, someone gives himself up to the indulgence in and enjoyment of the pleasures of the five senses. These are the four kinds of life devoted to pleasure which are low, vulgar, not leading to disenchantment, to enlightenment, to nibbana. And it may be that those of other sects might say, are the followers of the Sakyan given to these four forms of pleasure-seeking? They should be told, no, for they would not be speaking correctly about you. They would be slandering you with false and untrue statements. There are, Chunda, these four kinds of life devoted to pleasure, which are entirely conducive to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to tranquility, to realization, to enlightenment, to nibbana. What are they? Firstly, a monk, detached from all sense desires, detached from unwholesome mental states, enters and remains in the first jhana, which is with thinking, which is with thought directed and sustained, born of detachment, filled with delight and happiness, and with the subsiding of thought directed and sustained, by gaining inner tranquility and oneness of mind, he enters and remains in the second jhana, which is without thought directed and sustained, born of concentration, filled with delight and happiness. Again, with the fading of delight, remaining imperturbable, mindful and clearly aware, he experiences, he experiences in himself that joy of which the noble ones say, happy is he who dwells with equanimity and mindfulness. He enters and remains in the third jhana. Again, Having given up pleasure and pain, and with the disappearance of former gladness and sadness, he enters and remains in the fourth jhana, which is beyond pleasure and pain, and, purif and with utter purity of equanimity and mindfulness. There are these, these, these are the four kinds of life devoted to pleasure, which are entirely conducive to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to tranquility, to realization, to enlightenment, to nibbana. So if wanderers from other sects should say that the followers of the Sakyan are addicted to these four forms of pleasure-seeking, they should be told, yes, for they would be speaking correctly about you. They would not be slandering you with false or untrue statements. Then such wanderers might ask, well then, those who are given to these four forms of pleasure-seeking, how many fruits, how many benefits can they expect? And you should reply, they can expect four fruits, four benefits. What are they? The first is when a monk, by the destruction of three fetters, has become a stream winner, Sotapanna, no more subject to rebirth in lower worlds, firmly established, destined for full enlightenment, 
The second is when a monk, by the complete destruction of three factors and the reduction of greed, hatred and delusion, has become a once returner, Sakadagamin, and having returned once more to this world, will put an end to suffering. The third is when a monk, by the complete destruction of the five lower factors, has been spontaneously reborn and there will reach Nibbana without returning from that world, as the Anagamin. The fourth is when a monk, by the destruction of the Asavas, in this very life, has by his own knowledge and realization attained to Arahanship, to the liberation by mind and liberation by wisdom. Such are the four fruits and four benefits that one given to these four forms of pleasure-seeking can expect. Uh, stop me for a moment. So here the Buddha says uh, that his uh, disciples uh, are not uh, addicted to worldly pleasures, uh, which refers to uh, the pleasure uh, from killing, taking what is not given, uh, lying, uh, and pleasures of the senses. Uh. But uh, there are another four kinds of pleasures uh, which are conducive uh, to enlightenment, uh, to Nibbana, uh, that is the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, and fourth jhana. Uh, and uh, Buddha here says uh, that uh, the sons of the Sakyan, uh, that means uh, the Buddhist monks, uh, are addicted to the four forms of pleasure seeking. Uh, so why does the Buddha say his disciples are addicted to these four forms of pleasure seeking? The Buddha says, uh, because uh, there are four good fruits, uh, benefits. Uh, what are the four? Uh, attaining the four stages of Aryahood, uh, the four fruits. Uh, Sotapanna, uh, Sakadagamin, Anagamin and Arahanhood. Uh, uh. So this uh, contradicts some of these uh, 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 monks uh, who teach uh, that uh, jhana is not good. Uh. Jhana is not beneficial. Uh, there is no mindfulness in jhana. Uh, here the Buddha says uh, the, his, uh, he not only allows his monks uh, to practice the jhanas, uh, but he even encourages them to become addicted uh, to these uh, jhanas because they have four uh, benefits, uh, the four Aryan fruits. Uh. Then such wanderers might say the doctrines of the Sakyan sons are not well founded. They should be told, friend, the Lord who knows and sees has taught and proclaimed to his disciples principles which are not to be transgressed as long as life shall last. Just like a locking post or an iron post which is deep based, well planted and unshakable, immovable are these doctrines he has taught. And any monk who is an arahan whose asavas are destroyed who has lived the life, done what was to be done, laid down the burden, gained the true goal, who has completely destroyed the factor of being or becoming, and is liberated by supreme insight, is incapable of doing nine things. One, he is incapable of deliberately taking the life of a living being. Two, he is incapable of taking what is not given so as to constitute theft. Three, he is incapable of sexual intercourse. Four, he is incapable of telling a deliberate lie. 5. He is incapable of storing up goods for sensual indulgence, as he did formerly in the household life. 6. He is incapable of acting wrongly through attachment. 7. He is incapable of acting wrongly through hatred. 8. He is incapable of acting wrongly through folly. 9. He is incapable of acting wrongly through fear. These are the nine things which an arahan, whose asavas are destroyed cannot do. Stop here for a moment. So here it's very clear an arahan is not capable of killing, of taking what is not given, sexual intercourse, lying, storing up goods for sensual indulgence and acting wrongly. In the Vinaya books, the arahan is said uh, to be incapable of doing anything wrong. Why? Because he has mindfulness 24 hours a day. La. Every second uh, of the day and night, uh, the Arahan is mindful. Uh, 
Uh, it's not like us, uh, uh, most of us, uh, when we uh, go to sleep, uh, we are not mindful. Uh, we are not. So the Arahan, even when he takes his rest, uh, he is still mindful. Uh, that's one thing. Uh. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, the important thing here uh, is not capable, uh, he's not, uh, he, he, he is not, um, he's not given to sexual intercourse. Uh, this con- contradicts uh, some of the Mahayana teachings, uh, especially like in the uh, Vajrayana. They say uh, some of the enlightened beings uh, can indulge in this what they call uh, tantric Buddhism, uh, Tantra. This Tantra uh, is one of the secret teachings uh, that the disciple can make love uh, to, uh, the ma- master can make love to the disciple. Uh, and they say uh, they use this uh, to attain enlightenment. Uh, this is sheer folly, uh, sheer uh, contradiction of the Buddha's uh, teachings. La. Even during the Buddha's time, uh, they had this, this kind of practice. La. And there were some external ascetics uh, because uh, the, they were naked ascetics la. and they had uh, uh, male and female. La. So when they look at each other's bodies and uh, then lust arose la. and they say there's nothing wrong la, indulging in these uh, sexual pleasures. La. And they don't harm anybody. But the Buddha said it is foolishness, la. even though they don't harm anybody, they harm themselves. La. Uh, so, um, the Buddha says, uh, it's not possible uh, to engage in sexual intercourse uh, without lust. Uh, not, uh, not possible. Whereas uh, in the Mahayana, some of these Mahayana teachings, uh, they say uh, the aim is uh, uh, to 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 indulge in it uh, without uh, without lust, uh, but it's simply not possible. Or such wanderers might say, as regards past times, the ascetic Gautama displays boundless knowledge and insight, but not about the future, as to what will be and how it will be. That would be to suppose that knowledge and insight about one thing are to be produced by knowledge and insight about something else, as fools imagine. As regards the past, the Tathagata has knowledge of past lives. He can remember as far back as he wishes. As for the future, this knowledge, born of enlightenment, arises in him. This is the last birth. There will be no more becoming. If the past refers to what is not factual, to fables, to what is not of advantage, the Tathagata makes no reply. If it refers to what is factual, not fabulous, but which is not of advantage, the Tathagata makes no reply. But if the past refers to what is factual, not fabulous, and which is of advantage, then the Tathagata knows the right time to reply. The same applies to the future and the present. Therefore, Chunda, the Tathagata is called the one who declares the time, the fact, the advantage, the Dhamma and the Vinaya. That is why he is called Tathagata. Stop here for a moment. So here you see, uh, the Buddha says uh, he can recall uh, the past lives uh, as far back as he wishes. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, there's no limit. Uh. And then uh, if you ask him about the past, uh, uh, even if it's, if, it's, if it's something that is not factual, uh, he won't answer. Uh. And if it's not uh, uh, if, if it is factual, uh, but it's not advantageous, also he won't answer. Uh. Only if it is factual and it is advantageous. Advantageous means uh, it is of use uh, to the spiritual life. Uh. It will help somebody on the spiritual path. Uh. Then only he will reply. Uh. Uh, similarly, concerning the future and the present. Chunda. Whatever in this world, with its devas and maras and brahmas, with its ascetics and brahmins, its princes and people, is seen by people, heard, sensed, cognized, whatever was ever achieved, sought after, or mentally pondered upon, all that has been fully understood by the Tathagata. That is why he is called Tathagata. Between the night in which the Tathagata gained supreme enlightenment, Chunda, and the night in which he attains the Nibbana element without remainder, whatever he proclaims, says or explains is so, and not otherwise. That is why he is called Tathagata. 
and of this world with his devas and maras and brahmas, with his ascetics and brahmins, his princes and people, the Tathagata is the unvanquished conqueror, the seer and ruler of all. That is why he is called Tathagata. So here you notice the Buddha says uh, that whatever he says uh, is factual. Uh. So sometimes you read certain books, uh, uh, you see the Buddha says something here. And then you read some other books, uh, they say the Buddha says the opposite. Uh. Then two of them cannot be the true. Um, only one of them must be the true, uh, true truth. Uh. So you have to investigate. Uh. For example, there's some contradiction between Mahayana teachings and Theravada early suttas. There's some contradiction between the Abhidhamma and the early suttas. There's some contradiction between the Visuddhi Maga and the early suttas. Uh, there's some contradiction between some things in the commentary and the suttas. Uh, so you have to investigate uh, and find out. Or such wonders might say, does the Tathagata exist after death? Is that true and any other view foolish? They should be told, friend, this has not been revealed by the Lord. Or does the Tathagata not exist after death? Or does he both exist and not exist after death? Does he neither exist nor not exist after death? They should be told, friend, this has not been revealed by the Lord. Then they may see, then they may say, why has the ascetic Gautama not revealed this? They should be told, friend, this is not conducive to welfare or to Dhamma or to the higher holy life or to disenchantment, dispassion, cessation, tranquility, realization, enlightenment, nibbana. That is why the Lord has not revealed it. Or they may say, Well, friend, what has the ascetic Gautama revealed? They should be told, This is suffering has been declared by the Lord. This is the arising of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. This is the path leading to the cessation of suffering. These have been declared by the Lord. Then they may see, then they may say, why has this been declared by the ascetic Gotama? They should be told, friend, this is conducive to welfare, to Dhamma, to the higher holy life, perfect disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to tranquility, to realization, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. That is why the Lord has revealed it. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So if uh, people ask the Buddha huh, certain things huh, that do not pertain to the Dhamma. La. It does not help us to end suffering. La. The Buddha will keep quiet. La. He won't answer. La. Only if it has uh, something to do with the Dhamma, with the Four Noble Truths, la. the ending of the round of rebirths, la. then the Buddha will answer. La. Chunda, those bases of speculation about the beginnings of things which I have explained to you as they should be explained, should I now explain to you as they should not be explained. And likewise about the future. What are the speculations about the past? The ascetics and Brahmins who say and declare the self and the world are eternal. This is true and any other view is erroneous. The self and the world are not eternal. The self and the world are both eternal and not eternal. The self and the world are neither eternal nor not eternal. The self and the world are self-created. They are created by another. They are both self-created and created by another. They are neither self-created nor created by another, but have arisen by chance, and similarly with regard to pleasure and pain. Now, Chunda, I go to those ascetics and Brahmins who hold any of these views, and if being asked, they confirm that they do hold such views, I do not admit their claims. Why not? Because, Chunda, Different beings hold different opinions on such matters, nor do I consider such theories equal to my own, still less superior. I am the superior in regard to the higher exposition. As for those bases of speculation about the beginning of things, which I have explained to you as they should be explained, why should I now explain them to you as they should not be explained? And what about those speculators about the future? There are some ascetics and Brahmins who say, the self after death is material and healthy, or immaterial, or both, or neither. The self is conscious after death, or unconscious, or both, or neither. The self perishes, is destroyed, ceases to be after death. This is true, and any other view is erroneous. Now, Chunda, I go to those ascetics and Brahmins who hold any of these views, and if 
being asked, they confirm that they do hold such views. I do not admit their claims. Why not? Because, Chunda, different beings hold different opinions on such matters. Nor do I consider such theories equal to my own, still less superior. I am the superior in regard to the higher exposition. As for those bases of speculation about the future, which I have explained to you as they should be explained, why should I now explain them to you as they should not be explained? And Chunda, for the destruction of all such views about the past, future, for transcending them, I have taught and laid down the four intense states of mindfulness. What are the four? Here, Chunda, a monk dwells contemplating body in the body, ardent, clearly aware and mindful, having put aside hankering and fretting for the world. He dwells contemplating feelings in feelings, mind in mind, dhamma in dhamma, ardent, clearly aware and mindful, having put aside hankering and fretting for the world. That is how, Chunda, for the destruction of such views about the past and future, and for transcending them, I have taught and laid down the four intense states of mindfulness. During this time, the Venerable Upavana was standing behind the Lord, fanning him, and he said, It is wonderful, Lord. It is marvelous. Lord, this exposition of Dhamma is delightful, highly delightful. Lord, what is the name of this discourse? And the Buddha said, Well, Upavana, you can remember it as a delightful discourse. Thus the Lord spoke, and the Venerable Upavana rejoiced and was delighted with his words. That's the end of the Sutta. You see this last part, uh, the Buddha says, uh, to transcend uh, all the views about the past, present and the future, uh, the, he has taught the four intense states of mindfulness. Why? Because these four intense states of mindfulness uh, means uh, to put your mindfulness uh, on one object, uh, unremitting mindfulness on one object. Uh. Uh, so if you put your attention only on one object uh, all the time, uh, how can you have views about this present and future and past and all these things? Uh, so, if you continue uh, that uh, unremitting mindfulness on one object, uh, it must end up uh, with one pointedness of mind, uh, which is the jhanas. Uh, and then, uh, when a person attains the jhanas, uh, all that thinking, all the views uh, will automatically stop. Uh. All these views come from too much thinking. Uh. Because our mind uh, has a tendency uh, to proliferate, uh, papancha, this tendency to pro proliferate uh, in an undisciplined mind, uh, untrained mind. Okay, anything to discuss? Uh, you, um, can you repeat the question? I heard you say some people say uh, can reach Nibbana without jhana. Yeah, they say that once you can go jhana, what is your idea of reaching Nibbana otherwise? Where do they think that out of the secret? Oh, uh, they teach that you don't need uh, jhana to attain nibbana. They say uh, you cultivate wisdom. Uh, that is the path of pure vipassana. And that is not what the Buddha says. As I mentioned the other day, uh, they, they are making use of these commentaries which were written uh, several hundred years after the Buddha passed away by later monks. Uh, uh, these later monks, they did not uh, practice and attain the jhanas. So they think that the jhanas are, are, are not necessary. They think uh, they can attain wisdom uh, just by contemplation. Mm. Actually, the word vipassana means contemplation. Uh, but they have uh, sometimes uh, uh, changed it to insight. Uh, so they say the vipassana meditation is the... Is the uh, uh, meditation that gives you insight, that gives you wisdom. But in the Buddha's teachings, without jhana, there's no higher wisdom. Uh, does that answer your question? 
Worship who? Or my Triya Buddha? Uh, I think this is sheer foolishness. La. It's just like some people talk about the pure land. They want to be reborn in the pure land to be with the Amitabha Buddha. So there are some people want to be with Amitabha Buddha, some people want to be with Maitriya Buddha. But if you, if they are really Buddhas and you are reborn either with um, Amitabha Buddha or Maitreya Buddha, the teaching that you are going to get uh, is exactly what our Sakyamuna, Sakyamuni Buddha is teaching. So there is no point, uh, it's just sheer foolishness, uh, using the mind too much uh, because of proliferation of mind and they start thinking uh, good to be uh, to be born uh, with that Buddha and this Buddha and all that. Uh, uh. Wait a while. Wait. I think this is uh, wishful thinking uh, to be reborn with Maitreya Buddha. If you have not met Maitreya Buddha in the past, uh, you don't have strong affinity with Maitreya Buddha, how can you be reborn with him? Right? Uh, so, what is important uh, is uh, the Dhamma is here with us. So, make use of the Dhamma and try to at least uh, attain some stage of Aryahutna. If you can attain some stage of Aryahutna, you have entered the stream uh, that will flow towards Nibbana. Uh, you are sure of enlightenment, uh, even with the lowest Aryan uh, stage, uh, which is Sotapanna, within seven lifetimes uh, after that, uh, maximum of seven lifetimes, uh, a person will become enlightened, uh, that is guaranteed by the Buddha, stated by the Buddha. So that being the case, uh, it doesn't matter uh, where you are reborn, who you are reborn with. Uh, once you are an Arya, either uh, you will meet the Dhamma again, or if you don't meet the Dhamma, you will strive uh, until you can remember your past lives, uh, like our Buddha Sakyamuni, uh, when uh, he was uh, in his last life, uh, as Siddhartha Gautama, there was no Buddha Dhamma in the world, and yet uh, he just uh, knew uh, that he has to strive, uh, so he strove so hard until he could remember his past lives. Uh. And then all the Dhamma came back to him. What is important is the Dhamma. It's not the person that is important. The Dhamma is important. So whether we recall the Dhamma of Buddha Sakyamuni or Buddha uh, Kasapa or Buddha Kona Gamana or Buddha Kakusanda or some other Buddha, it doesn't matter uh, which Buddha. What is important is the Dhamma. So it is not important uh, to meet the, the, the Buddha in person. What is important is to meet the Dhamma. Meet the Dhamma. Then, uh, and once you're an Arya, you will either meet the Dhamma or the, or you will uh, recall the Dhamma. Uh, somehow uh, you will uh, enter Nibbana. Uh, that is important. Who you meet is not important. It's only worldly thinking, uh, worldly thinking. Uh. When you love somebody, you think you want to meet him again or her again in the future. Uh. That is pure uh, 
pure the flow of asavas, la, this uncontrolled mental outflows, la, thinking too much. La, uh. Sustain what? This one, I think it depends on the individual. Uh, um, if the person is uh, understands the Dhamma, then uh, he will always keep the Dhamma close uh, to him. No? Either uh, every day he will study the suttas and meditate. No? Uh, but if a person does not have the affinity, uh, you can advise him all you 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 you, you want, uh, but he will not uh, be able to follow it. Uh. So it depends on our blessings. Uh. That's why the Buddha says uh, we have to cultivate our blessings. Uh. And uh, some of these things uh, we have no control. Uh. It's uh, entirely up to the individual. Uh. If a person is time is not due, uh, he can give a thousand and one reasons uh, why he has to uh, uh, be distracted uh, in doing this and doing that. No? No, definitely not. Okay, shall we end here? Yeah?